Welcome to another edition of the Vine Resources Podcast Show. Well, look, today I'm delighted to be in Mediacom's uh, Towers, Head yes. Office Towers, here in central London in Holborn, and I'm here with Sue uh, Uniman. <laughs> I wanted to make sure I pronounced that thank correctly. You. Thank you, David. <laughs> Sue, thank you so much for welcoming us to your office. Well, I'm very flattered to be asked. Um, Sue, you're the Chief Transformation Officer for the company. Yep. The company has over 9,000 employees worldwide, worldwide roughly, yep. Yep. and you have over 1,500 in the UK alone. Yep. Um, I mentioned. I know you work with some some pretty amazing customers like Sky, yep. PSA. Yep. Uh, there's a few more. Direct Line Group, Direct. Universal Pictures, amazing. Um, Tesco, fantastic, amazing clients. Cancer Research, brilliant. And and as I said, uh, as we were walking in the building, it's a wonderful welcome into your company, oh, and good. it feels really special just coming in, which was which was a nice experience. Thank you for joining me on our podcast show. Well, I'm delighted to be here. So why don't you give our listeners just a little bit of an insight into uh, Mediacom, what, what you do yeah. and, uh, and, and your role in the company? Okay, so Mediacom is the largest, biggest and best media planning and buying agency in the UK. So what we do is we work out how to help our clients grow their business through advertising and through content. We give them advice about that and then we buy the space, we create some of the content. So. Mm-hmm. Um, Things like um, uh, influencer content and that kind of thing, mm. and sponsorship credits, and even advertiser-funded programming. Less so the adverts, the thirty-second ads we don't do, but we will place those. Mm-hmm. So we will work out where they should go, um, and um, buy them, buy and execute that for, on behalf of our clients. And then we'll also work out, in a lot of cases, what the accountability of that is via various kind of te- techniques like research techniques and econometrics and that kind of thing. And we work now. Um, our billings through the UK alone is about 1.8 billion Um, so we are the biggest in the UK and I've been here a ridiculously long amount of time I actually joined the company when we were tiny and our billings were just 45 million so what we've done is we've grown as our clients have grown Um, and my role as Chief Transformation Officer is all about change Mm -hmm. so as you all know with of course your day job change is everywhere and the, the, the change is the only certainty, is yeah. that there's going to be more change. Yeah. And with the role of Chief Transformation Officer, it's about making sure that we as Mediacom are at the leading edge of that change and transformation on behalf of our clients, mm-hmm. but also to do a bit of sorting out the trends that are important from the trends that are just nonsense, the, the kind of the, the love of the new that, mm-hmm. that ha- actually hasn't got anything to do with real customers out there in, in you know, Great Britain overall. That's a great point, and I was going to say, keeping close, I said, dare I say it, to the money as well, yeah. you know, for a return on your your Yeah, your return customers. on investment, but yep. also keeping close, really close to the consumers, because yep. there's loads of things going on, but if you follow the customer, the customer is right. Yeah. The customer knows what's going on. Now, you mentioned, obviously, you've been in the industry a long time. Yep. You've seen a huge amount of change. Yeah. I'd love to know, what does a typical day in the business look like for you as the leader? That's a, that's, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, and I have a multifaceted role because I sit on the overall UK Exco. Mm-hmm. Today actually wasn't typical at all because we had our the final of Connected Pitching, which is our big competition. Over 900 people get involved in it across um, the company and we also involve our media owner partners Mm -hmm. where everybody does a pitch and the winning pitches get to go to the Grand Prix on a brand and today I judge the Grand Prix. So that was really exciting. So it was a really fascinating and kind of rich day. Um, But as well as that, I'm on kind of improving creativity, pushing it to the next boundaries Mm -hmm. on behalf of our clients talking to our clients about changes that are coming up and what's important and really how to grow and where to find growth these days when things are so difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, and then over and above that, um, we've got a consultancy mm-hmm. called Theobald's Road Consulting, um, which we set up a couple of years ago. And so I'm the ex sponsor for that. So helping involve them in our clients' um, uh, needs when uh, necessary. Um, And then over and above all of that, quite a lot of my typical day at the moment is um, either talking about diversity and inclusiveness or interviewing people for my next book, which we've just been commissioned for. So you mentioned that. Can I I plug the... Of course you can. Yes, absolutely. So the the current book is The Glass Wall, Success Strategies for Women at Work and Businesses that Mean Business. And we wrote this book, me and my co-author Catherine Jacob, who's CEO Mm -hmm. of Pearl and Dean... (coughs) We wrote it um, in 2015 when the proportion of women on the FTSE 100 boards Mm -hmm. had just been announced um, as 26%. 
which they were saying was good news. They were saying, look, we've smashed our target of 25%. But of course, what's the proportion of women in the population, David? Mm -hmm. I don't know, actually. It's probably high, higher, 51%, is it? 51%. 51%. Right, okay, and has over. been for some time. <laughs> so we've <laughs> so got a long way to go. I don't know what the target was. <laughs> but also, the women on the FTSE 100, that 26%, which has now risen to about 30%, yeah. um, most of them are non-executive directors. They're not executive directors working for that company. And the proportion of executive directors on the FTSE 100, mm -hmm. indeed the FTSE 250, indeed the FTSE 350, is 2%. Wow. Right, so there is a long, long way to go. So what we've done in our book is we've pulled together 41 case studies mm -hmm. of what we're calling the glass wall problem. So that kind of invis invisible barrier that's existing in the workplace that's preventing women from really taking their fair share of senior roles mm -hmm. um, and also preventing businesses from benefiting from the diversity that, that women um, and indeed other diverse um, mm -hmm. actual minorities can bring to a board and to bring to decision making. I was going to say the the books then not only for, for perhaps females who want to be inspired and, and to move forward but also perhaps for senior executives yeah. who, who want to diversify and, 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 and also reap the benefits of that in their, in their boardroom. Is so what right? we read, you're absolutely right. And what, yeah. what we've done in the book, in the, in the 41 mm -hmm. case studies, is given advice for the women on their way up. Yep. So we're calling it pragmatic feminism. So it's no hold bars, very <laughs> frank. This is how you solve this problem, whether you like it or not. Yeah. Um, but also advice for the businesses who are missing out on that mm -hmm. talent and very often don't know why. Mm -hmm. um, and we interviewed a lot of people for the book, well, you know, obviously before we wrote it, but then subsequent to that, we've given over 150 talks mm -hmm. in businesses up and down the UK and indeed outside the UK. Um, and the book actually covers stories from worldwide as well with research from worldwide. And what we what we found over and over again is that there's a lot of very similar, you know, gender... We try to avoid the gender cliches, but there are gender differences and they are very often the issue that come up over and over again because the workplace, mm -hmm. the norm in the workplace hasn't been designed for normal. Mm -hmm. It's been designed for really patriarchal, you know, often quite hideous um, masculine norms. So not even what a norm that any normal man would call a norm, but a kind of, you know, 24-7 let's all shout at some people, isn't necessarily the way to run a business well, particularly in, in the 21st century. And the kind of diversity that you need in order to cope with the sort of change that's going on at the moment um, doesn't come from businesses that are running with those sorts of cultures. If you, I'm going to put you on the spot now. Yeah. If there was one thing in the book that if someone was picking it up now or listening yeah. to it, maybe on an audio book or whatever, particularly for those females who perhaps want to need, need some of that empowerment to move yeah. forward in their career or just starting out what's the one thing that, that you'd say this was a, this is a nugget of gold for them you've got to show off more right what do you mean by that so um there's actually a story want to kind of tell you one of the stories in the book yeah sure. so this is actually told to me by um a woman who doesn't work in in my sector in advertising she actually works in um uh, uh the, the health sector mm -hmm. and she was telling me a story actually about an easter egg hunt that she goes on with her um her kids every year mm -hmm. and it become quite a regular thing and she said you know this was the first year that my little boy one of twins was three years old old enough to properly join in with he said they got into a routine with the easter egg hunt the dads would hide the easter eggs i'm doing gender stereotypes already and those little gold bunnies you know the mm -hmm. ones i mean yeah and the mums would lay out the picnic and the kids would all go and get the eggs there was about you know 12 10 kids i think and the oldest kid was 12 the littlest ones were were this little boy and his twin sister um, and every year they collected them up, they brought them back to the picnic site, they shared them out, um, and all the other children happened to be girls, just so happened that, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're the girls were friends with the girls. Um, and that had been how it had gone, except for the very first year that this little boy was old enough to properly join in. And he came running back to the picnic site, ahead of anyone else, all on his own, jumped into the middle of it, and she said, everybody's going, oh, what's, what's happening? Is, is he all right? And he jumps in the middle, and he holds up this gold bunny and he shouts out, I've won. I've won, mummy and daddy. I've won. I won the gold bunny. And there's a bit of a pause. And this woman said to me, you know, I could see what the my friends, the other mums were mm -hmm. thinking, which was, well, hang on a second. No one's ever won the Easter egg hunt before. And anyway, there's more than one gold bunny. You know, we don't necessarily know that you found it. But no one wanted to say anything to disappoint this little boy. It's a bit of silence. And the dad speaks up and the dad goes... Yeah, that's right, you've won. You've beaten all the girls. Well done, you. 
And she said to me afterwards, she right. said, look, two things about this. First of all, she doesn't think, this is how little boys and little, boy, little girls get treated differently. She doesn't think yeah. that, that anyone would have said to the little girl if she'd come back and said, I've beaten everyone else, well done, that Very she true. would have been told, no, but we share, we share mm. things. Mm. But she said she also realised at that point that that's what goes on day in, day out at work, that little boys who have now become grown-up men are showing off. And, and she works in health and, you know, they have real emergencies in health, you know, in, in advertising, we have all kinds of emergencies and we think it's life and death, but actually it's, it's money, it's not life and death, right? right? But it, with them, it's actually serious. And so if her boss asks her what's going on, you know, she'll go, there's no problem, everything's fine, don't worry about a thing. But that if her boss said to one of her colleagues, who's a man, what's going on, he would go, oh, it's all fine now. There was a huge problem, but I solved it. I saved the day, don't worry about a thing. And then those same few moments, he's lining themselves up for pay rises, promotions, not her, but him. Um, we found this to be very true. So there are women out there who are working so hard, we get asked this question over and over again at the um, uh, talks that we give. But I'm, I'm working really hard and I'm doing really good work. Why should I have to show off about it? Surely someone will notice. And the mm. truth just is that you need to find a way to show off a bit. There are lots of ways to show off, but you need to find a way. And then equally, look, if you're a boss, if you're a manager, mm -hmm. try and give the quieter people in your team a structured opportunity to, to tell you how well they're doing. Because what happens all over the place and I think any manager would own up to this, is that it is easier to promote someone who is good at getting promoted than it is to promote someone who might be good at the job into which they're being promoted, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Because the people who are, you know, people campaign to get promoted, right? Mm -hmm. They're the ones that get promoted. That's not necessarily good management, but it happens too often. So what I would say to any woman out there is that if you're not showing off, your men colleagues probably are showing off and you need to find a way of doing it and there are ways of doing it in the book that aren't too awkward there we go, there and, we it's, go. and it's available on amazon right now amazon right now yeah so who has in, who has been a tremendous impact on you in your career and who even perhaps is still a mentor to you that you can share a little bit with us well it, this is going to sound a little bit you know sucky uppy but mm -hmm. um i've worked with my global ceo who's a man called stephen allen since 1990 mm -hmm. And when I joined um, what was then a company called The Media Business, because mm -hmm. um, we got acquired by Mediacom, we were 44 million, um, as I said, and he was head of new business. And he and I set out to win some new business together. And mm. I'd never worked with somebody before who was so good, really, at running a team. Um, and now, you know, 1.9 1, 1. Um, billion in the UK c uh, coming up yeah, to amazing. that, and, you know, much, much, much bigger um, around the world. And he still has that culture of creating a team that can work well together. You know, our global slogan is people first, better results. And if I kind of put it in context, wherever I'd worked before then, and indeed all through school, you know, at school, you get taught to work really hard but not to let anyone copy your work so mm -hmm. you're like this right mm -hmm. and really where i'd worked before i worked um with steve the way that you got on was that you sort of got on by pushing other people down a bit that mm -hmm. was success and i arrived and started working with steven and um he's all about the team he's all about loyalty he's all about working out what people's strengths and weaknesses are and then playing them in those positions um, like a good football team manager mm -hmm. really now um, and I think one of the things that he said to me once I don't even know if he remembers this but hopefully he'll listen to this and um, he, he will remember um, was that I was asking him a question about something and I was quite anxious about what I should do or what I shouldn't do and he said to me you know what Sue J just be yourself he said that's all I want you to do just be yourself you know, what brilliant thing for your boss to say to you if there's one thing that you can be really good at really better at than anyone else is being yourself right mm -hmm. and I came out of that with so much increased confidence um, and it still resonates with me today and I and I hope that I help other people to be themselves because I do believe that if you concentrate on that if you if you if you focus on being your best self mm -hmm. then that's how you can succeed well let's talk about being best self yeah. there in terms of your employee engagement, 
how, how are you helping your team be their best for themselves? So we have a, I mean, we take people first, better results very seriously right. um, at Mediacom. It's mm -hmm. not just a slogan. Okay. It's not something that's, you know, belongs to the HR department. It belongs to everybody who works at Mediacom. And yes, to all of the senior management, but we also believe in this respect about leading from every seat. Mm -hmm. So it is about the culture of the company. It is a sense. So sometimes when I'm interviewing people, um, and we have lots of official programs to encourage this, but I do think it's deep down about the culture. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when I'm interviewing to people, I, I sort of explain to them, or I have done in the past, that um, you know, if you if you do really good work at Mediacom, you'll get a gold star. But if you help someone else do really good work, you'll get ten gold stars. Mm. And that's really what we're trying to do. And rather than succeeding by pushing other people down, you succeed here by helping other people up. Mm, that's um, great. And sometimes when I'm talking to someone about that, they'll go. But how will, you, how will you know it was me so that I can get the 10 gold stars? And I kind of think, well, you're probably not for us then. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so it's so there is a lot of um, diversity and inclusiveness work that we do. Um, we have a very big mental health allies program. We mm -hmm. have freshness programs where we encourage people to break up the kind of day. Um, we have creativity training for everybody because, again, this is one of my big bugbears is I... I don't like the you know a lot of companies a lot of creativity training schemes as yeah. well they say give us give us your half a dozen best people the really mm -hmm. strong creative people and we'll take them away and we'll you know train them up for a couple of weeks and then we'll give them back to you they'll be transformed mm -hmm. i don't want six people transformed i want you know 1500 people transformed um and so when we train for creativity we train everybody and we've done that several times um and uh, when, I'm, when I say everybody, I mean everybody. I, I mean from the people who put out the teas and coffees and greeted you on reception mm -hmm. through to the CEO. Mm -hmm. um, and inclusiveness is probably the, the thing that matters most. Is everyone included? Great. And we can hear that today in some of the celebrations you've got for uh for, We've got for a lot way. going on. Yeah, <laughs> we, do, we do have um, a lot going on. We've got um, employee res uh, resource groups, and yeah. we've actually got about, I think there's nine of them, mm -hmm. um, all of whom have a glo uh, a, an Exco sponsor who kind of supports them and senior management who join in with it. And indeed, it's... it's um, it's uh, Diwali today, so yeah. there's been celebrations of that been going on. You, you've beaten my... I've ticked off my question for right. well-being because it yeah. almost sounds like you're, you've answered it. But I, I'm just curious to know what you think is the biggest challenge right now facing business leaders at the moment. What's, what, what, you know, with it's change. It, with it, I was going to say, it's, with a very changing change. industry, of course. It's, it's everyone's changing. Yeah. And it's even, even if you're an established brand, established company, you're worried about the disruptors. Mm -hmm. The disruptors... And I worried about the next lot of disruptors. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's absolutely um, ongoing. Um, f uh, f it's not FOMO anymore. It's not fear of missing out. It's certainty of missing out. I mean, there is so much going on in in, in my industry. Mm -hmm. Things are changing all the time. There are new an acronyms every time you walk into a into a meeting, um, and staying on top of that and helping our clients stay on top of that is absolutely our responsibility but also helping people deal with the stress of that mm -hmm. um, because there are people who get very stressed about it. Um, and we do have um, a big and kind of industry leading mental health allies program here. So right. we've had loads of people. Um, I mean, time, time, uh, time to talk is, is uh, one of our clients anyway mm -hmm. um, uh, from mind, right. but we have a big program where we've trained a lot of people as mental health allies and they wear um, uh, uh, green lanyards so that if you are going through difficult times, and you know everybody does mm -hmm. sometimes. I mean, it's, uh, I always think when they say the statistic for people who have mental kind of um, illness is one in four, it's kind of like it's everyone really sometimes. You know, we've, we all have difficult days and some, some days are more difficult than others. So here there's always someone to talk to and they're trained in how to help, what to say, um, and, and you know, how to kind of find other resources when things are particularly difficult. And I think that's really important. We, you know, we live in this age where everybody thinks they've got to be on on it the whole time, and that's not healthy. And what we value most here is people staying healthy. Mm. What's the What's the best piece of business advice you've ever received? I was thinking about this because you gave me a bit of warning about this. 
um, in advance. Not another and one from Steve. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't tell you who who gave me this as advice, but I th I try and do it every day. Okay. And it's simplifying things. Okay. Simplify. You know the expression K I S S. Yep. Keep it simple, sweetie. Let's say. Very um, true. And the more complicated everything gets, the more people will love you if you can s simplify things. And yep. um, I, you know, people who, you know. People who wear black jeans and black t-shirts and talk in acronyms and complicate things are now ten a penny, right? You can find them everywhere and they might be entertaining for a bit, but they're not necessarily helpful. Mm -hmm. And I really value people that can take com complicated concepts and simplify them and I try and simplify things myself. We've talked about the, the challenges in the industry and there's lots of it happening all the time, but what excites you still about this industry? Change. Okay. <laughs> so the same thing. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, that it's... There is so much going on the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, my particular craft, I suppose, which is about helping our, our clients, um, customers, so mm -hmm. consumers out there, mm -hmm. understand the brands and understand the advertising message. Um, all of that has become so much more accountable and we've got such better techniques in understanding how to reach people and then monitoring how well we're doing. Mm -hmm. And all of those developments are going to get supercharged by artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So things now that um, are kind of work in theory very soon, and I think this year will be a turning point year because it's, it's, it's something that's been building up. Um, there will be a turning point. There will be intelligent use of data. So I think data has been a massive buzzword. But data is nothing without the kind of whole brain kind mm -hmm. of approach to it that says this is how we use data in order to drive client advantage. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's very exciting. What, what's the, um, or, or perhaps, is there a story or something you can share from your earlier childhood that, that really resonated and influenced your work ethic later yeah. in life? Is there anything yeah, you is. can share with us? There is. Go so my <laughs> big thing is um, helping people, brands, work myself fulfill potential I, I i can't bet it's where the glass wall came from it's where the previous book tell the truth came from um it's where the next book's going to come from i can't yeah, the whole thing about the glass wall is that's that's a frustrating thing that's stopping women fulfilling their potential in their careers for the wrong reasons mm. i can't bear it, i can't bear it if work isn't sort of it doesn't get to as good as it can do i mean it's like i i'm Someone once said to me, my dear colleague Luke once said to me, the thing about you, Sue, is, is that good enough just isn't good enough for you, is it? Mm. And, and that's true. That's what keeps me motivated. I know exactly where it came, comes from. It comes from the fact that I was, I was not an early starter in terms mm -hmm. of potential. Um, when I was at school, um, uh, in my school, in the first two years of senior school, um, if you got um, six A minuses in a row or three A's in a row, then you got a good work mark. And if you got a good work mark, um, you got your name read out in assembly at the end of term. And um, I never got any good work marks. And my, the, my mm -hmm. friend that I sat next to, uh, used to get them every, she's, every week, she'd go, um, uh, Sue, are you coming with me? Because I'm going to get my good work marks signed up in the headmistress's office. And every week I go, I haven't got some. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, I could have, I could have, I, I could have had a really downbeat reaction to that. I suppose I could have gone. Um, they don't appreciate me. I'm never going to get anywhere. Actually, after sitting through six school assemblies, during which I kind of hoped that they would read my name out by mistake. I mean, it sounds mm. really stupid now, but I kind of really hoped that they would. I got really angry, and I was sure that I was good enough to do well. And I just really focused hmm. and I hit the library and I worked out what the techniques were from lifting work from B plus to A minus or hmm. even an A. I got, I aced my kind of um, what were then for me O levels. Mm -hmm. And then I was the only girl in my year to get into Oxbridge fourth term. Um, at which point um, they did read my name out in assembly, um, but they pronounced it wrong. We were talking about the pronunciation <laughs> of my name. So it kind of wasn't such a great moment then. But um, that was from sort of probably sort of you know first two years to the to the, my early sixth form, um, but it just led me to this hatred of not of letting stuff kind of go before the potential is fulfill, fulfilled, mm -hmm. and also to feel as though I I really know that everybody out there has got the potential to be 
great. They've mm -hmm. just got to work out what it is that they're going to be great at and then focus on how to achieve it. You touched a minute ago about the you know AI affecting and massively impacting your industry yeah. in the future. What are the other things that you think is going to impact uh, the business model and what's it might might it look like in you know five years time? Well, that's five years time is. I it's mean, a long I, time, of course. I am what, not one answering time. questions. <laughs> <laughs> five years time. It's a crystal now. ball. It's a crystal no, ball. It is a crystal. It is a crystal ball. I think so. I think AI about? is going to make a massive yeah. difference. I mm -hmm. think we're going to see a. Um, reshaping of our industry in terms of the sorts of jobs that there are yeah. I think we're going to have um, to um, really that whole brain intelligence thing mm -hmm. whereby you can apply empathy mm -hmm. and real human insight and understanding of, of customers and we spend a lot of time here making sure that everybody in the UK business is empathetic and it's one of the reasons why we uniquely for our set to have offices up and down the country um, so that we're not stuck in the London mm -hmm. bubble but really knowing what's going on um, with the customer but match that or the consumer but actually match that with um, how to read data mm -hmm. um, and how to um, combine if you like the more qual kind of ways of looking at things with the more quant ways of, of looking at things and I think we're going to need a breed of people, and I think we have a lot of them here, but a breed of people who can really see across, you know, there's old fashioned left brain, right brain mm -hmm. kind of sort of differentiations. We need people who can see across both. We need people who can understand what has always worked and will always work in terms of getting to um, uh, customers, but also the newest ways and how those relate to each other and, and what the new rules and new heuristics are. So people who can have a perspective across everything we're going to have we're going to have um, jobs for, for, for them now I've got one final question to ask you but before I do you've obviously you've got a new book coming out as well I did want to mention out. that yeah what's the new book called so um, we haven't finalized that okay yet, but I can I can tell you what it's about yeah there's been so much oxygen given to diversity and inclusiveness over the last three years mm -hmm. but statistics haven't changed very much so We've been, we've give, had lots and lots of conversations. We've been out talking to loads of people mm -hmm. and we get invited everywhere. But um, I think year on year, the gender pay gap stats went backwards in mm -hmm. so many um, British firms that had to declare them. And, and, you know, we'll see what next year's are like, but, mm -hmm. you know, who knows? And so we said to ourselves, well, what needs to be done now? Mm -hmm. What's diversity 2.0 look like? If, if the things that people are trying now aren't working, what, what needs to happen? And we think it, it, what's happening is that there's a large proportion of the work population who are feeling left out of inclusive conversations. Um, and frankly, straight white men, who, some of whom are feeling as though everything's too complicated and the st stakes are too high, you say the wrong thing, who knows what happened to your career, so better not say anything at all. <laughs> or others who are feeling that they're just not wanted and that they're not gonna get a job because someone else is you know, gonna get it because they are a woman or you know mm -hmm. from a BAME background or something um, and so we've got some blocks to inclusiveness in the in the in the workplace because that's not what inclusiveness means right it doesn't mean not including everybody mm -hmm. so the next book is about how to create a sense of belonging and inclusiveness for everybody now I, I'm going to mention something a bit of a plug here but for Ben Elton I only saw him on Saturday right. night and maybe because he was talking exactly about this topic was he? I'll, I'll see if I can get him on the phone and organise a coffee with you. That would I, be amazing. I'm sure it would be fascinating. That would be absolutely amazing. <laughs> um, Thank you. That would be brilliant. Final question. If you were giving yourself, your 20-year-old self yeah. advice, what's the just one thing that you would now say to yourself? Just don't worry as much as you're worrying. Mm. Um, and I think probably, you know, I didn't know Steve when I was 20, be yeah. yourself. Yeah. I mean, I, I was like, you you so easy to come into a workplace and think, what do I need to do to fit that culture? Yeah, yeah. And if everyone's trying to fit with the culture, then A, the culture isn't rich and it doesn't kind of diversify. But B, you're spending all that effort that you could be spending on doing good work, mm. on worrying about um, fitting in. And so don't worry about fitting in, just be yourself. Fantastic. Thank you so much no, for joining thank the podcast. Thanks for welcoming us to your office today. And uh, yeah, best of luck with, the, with obviously the books and the business. Yeah, brilliant. Take thank care. You.